delta function first. So I haven't been in, entirely clear about this. So and I, I've been using that delta sign to mean two slightly different things. So if it's a density or if it's an integration over a density, and I've kind of just glossed over it. So um, let me at least write out what the base factor is that we had last time, or at least the, the numerator term. Let's do this. So let's just say our numerator and our base factor. So this is going to be beta j is equal to zero. That's my null. So the, the numerator term looks like this. So integrate e to the minus 1 half y minus x theta transpose y minus x theta over sigma squared. So that's all up in the exponent. And I've been writing this thing down. Beta j is equal to 0. 1 over 2 pi. So psi, this is p to the minus 1, e to the minus 1 half beta minus j, transpose beta minus j, divided by psi squared. And I'm going to integrate over all of the betas, where this is all of them, beta 1 to beta p, right here. So it's a good question, Nathan. Uh, so I've been asked this a couple times, what the heck is going on? Because when we learned to do integration, if I removed one point, it doesn't do anything. But there's zero mass for that one point. Now, um, that was until we introduced this notation. So keep in mind what we learn about in integral, why we can remove a point, is we're comparing to everything else in the space. So we're adding up this infinitely fine thing. And so the mass in the entire, the rest of the space when you're doing that Riemann sum integral, it dominates everything at, at one point. So you could remove that one point. What I actually mean um, is I've been writing this down, delta beta j equal to a zero. And I've been saying this is a one or a zero. But what I really mean in terms of this notation, if I think about this as a density function, what I really mean is if I integrate this beta j, this is a 1 or a 0. And this is beta j is equal to 0. And this is otherwise right here. So this is a density function. So I've been inconsistent. In all the other places, like when we deal with Bernoulli's or something like that, I was using it as just a switch, a 1 or a 0. And this is a slightly different notation. So I'm going to write this out like this just to distinguish it. Oftentimes, I've been calling what I, the way that I've been using the notation before was this, that this really is this switch of one or a zero. But when we integrate under it, we might mean something slightly different. And what I mean is that this is a zero everywhere but beta j. So this is all zero over here. And then at this point, beta j, this is infinitely high. So, and it's infinitely thin. And these funny things happen with this infinitely tall thing and this infinitely thin thing. And so as I take the limit, we're just going to demand that whatever that function is, the rate at which it's going high and the rate at which I'm summing over things in the Riemann sum integral, it happens in such a way that I integrate to 1 when beta j is a 0, otherwise 0 everywhere else. So what I don't, so I don't really mean that this is the 1 or a 0 right here. What I mean is this is this infinitely high density. And when I integrate over it, it acts like the switch, where it's going to be a 1 or a 0, depending on if beta j is a 0 or not. Now, you would need a measure theory class dealing with infinities in just the right way to fully understand that. I don't know if I fully understand it. I never really understand infinity. So, but I understand what the point is. So, 
But when I integrate over it, it's a one or a zero. And so that's what's going on right here. And that's why this is a little different than just removing the point and thinking it doesn't matter. So when we integrate over beta j is equal to zero, I just mean that beta j in this vector is going to be a zero. And so that's effectively the exact same thing. It's that once I integrate over beta j is equal to zero, it's just zeroing out that column in x. And that's equivalent to that. Does that make sense? So in the we went through in the class. I think you went straight from this step to gain of delta and just make the betas uh -huh. to be a minus j. Yeah, exactly. So like mm -hmm. what I've done explicitly, let's just say this. This is going to be minus one half beta j transpose beta j. Well, I'll just say beta j squared since it's only one beta j in there. So divided by sigma squared. I'm just going to write this thing out kind of arbitrarily, beta j. But when I do this, beta j is equal to a zero right here. What I mean is this is e to the minus one half zero squared over sigma squared. So it just zeroes that thing out. So I just plug that in as a zero right there. So yeah, you're just, when you're integrating through this thing, it's just like taking beta j and putting it in a zero. So you could take this whole equation right here, get rid of this right here, and just plug in beta j is equal to zero in this integral. So just plug that thing in. When you plug in beta j is equal to a zero in this vector right here, so beta j is equal to a zero when it multiplies through this column right here, it's just ripping out that whole column effectively. So treat it as just plugging in beta j is equal to a zero when you integrate over beta j. So into everything in the integrand. That's what I mean. Does that kind of make sense? So I have been inconsistent, and I always try to just slide this through So because I don't want to talk about a delta function is an actual density function, and you can think about it that way. So instead, we'll just think about it as a switch. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Cool. So, so that's what we're doing. Our base factor that we worked out is just one such base factor that we're going to use in the SSVS algorithm. So let me just write down what the base factor is again. There it is. So our base factor. E to the plus one half E zero J transpose D zero J E is minus one E to the zero J so times V zero J plus one half over psi to the p minus 1 divided by e to the plus 1 half e transpose v, zero, v inverse e times v plus one half. Over psi t. So all of these except for one of them cancel each other. So this is a specific base factor to give you a general idea. So this is the base factor for going from the full model to beta j is equal to zero. So it's just removing one. So with the first iteration of the algorithm, you'll be using this base factor. So but after you get through that first iteration, you're going to be using a different base factor. So let me just write it down a little bit simpler. On average, this is the exact same algorithm that I wrote down in class. 
and we're going to iterate through some loop for some large number of iterations. So that's, we're going to have burn it in for a while, so run it for a long time, and then run it even longer. So throw away all the burn in stuff. But what you're going to do is you're going to have, I'm going to make this just a little bit easier. Instead of doing a full loop right here, I'm just going to flip a coin. And on average, this is the same idea. So I'm going to take J and I'm going to get it from a uniform between 1 and P. So all the different covariates. You might think that beta 0 is the intercept or something. My recommendation is don't touch it. Don't throw away your intercept. So keep it in there. If it happens to be something close to zero, let it be something close to zero. So this is a little bit different than the um, algorithm that I wrote down before. So let's just remember what x looks like. You've got x1 all the way to xp. So these are just column vectors. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to think about just the j1, and I'm going to grab it at random. And I'm going to decide whether or not that should be in the model or not in the model. And so in the first iteration, when t is equal to 1, we're going to start with the full model. And so that's going to be the model where the margin of the data is everything except for that. This stuff right here. So this will be the margin of the data under the full model. And I'm going to decide whether or not I want to remove the j column from everything. Effectively, let beta j equal to 0. So in the first iteration, I'm going to go over here to this thing and take the j thing and remove it from everything. Do you remember what the forms of E and D look like? Just to be clear about this, E itself, let's do V first. What's V? X transpose X by sigma squared. X transpose X by sigma squared. X transpose X <coughs> inverse. No, uh, it's the whole thing inverse, right? Right. So this over sigma squared. One over sigma squared. Plus. 1 over psi squared times i, and then the whole thing is There we go. Thing. Perfect. So this is the v that's in here, right here. The e is going to look really similar. It's going to look like v times x <coughs> transpose y. And so by sigma squared. <laughs> sigma squared. Yes. So, easy one to forget about. So that's what E looks like down here. The E for this one is really just the exact same form, but instead of using full X, I'm just going to remove the J column. So we're going to take an X that looked just like the full X, but I'm going to remove the J column, and then I'm going to form these two expectation and variance, and that's what we're calling the E0 and the V0. Terms. So we're just taking the J term, ripping it out, and we're just saying, we're just giving it some new notation. So we're going to form this thing in the upstairs using forms just like this, but they're going to be slightly different X matrices that we're plugging into everything. Does that make sense? Cool. So we'll take our base factor and we'll compute a posterior probability. So probability that beta J is equal to the zero, given everything else, is just going to be one plus one minus pi naught j. You could let these all be different for each one of the covariates, but you're probably going to let these just be a half to half. So most likely this thing is going to be one. So then I'm going to take this phase factor that we just computed. I'm going to invert it, and then I'm going to invert all of that. That's just Bayes' theorem to come up with this probability right here. So I'm going to compute that probability. I'm going to flip this coin 
How am I going to do it? I'm going to check this if statement. If, and I'll just call this T star right here. A uniform 0, 1 is less than or equal to T star. So how often does that happen? Happens with probability P star that thing. So that is my Bernoulli point flip. Then I'm going to take our new X, so our new full model. So I'll say our new model is going to be X minus J. So I'm going to get rid of that word full model. It might confuse you. So our new model is this thing right here. This is our x minus j. And so else, you don't do anything. Your new model is your old model. Is the old model. So I'm going to call this thing right here, I'm going to call this x star. So that's my new model right here, and I'm just going to say x star is our, or x star is going to be equal to cap x, our old model. So I might call this x old, right here. So this might be x new, if you want, but I'm going to say this thing right here is equal to that. Then I'm going to come back to the top. So now I'm going to flip a new coin, and I'm going to take the jth column in here. There's a couple different possibilities that can happen. So J is anything other than this new thing. So I'm going to leave J to mean the same thing 1 to P. So I'm not going to be changing the index definitions. So I'm going to come up with a new J. If it's this J right here, I can decide one of two things. So I can decide to try to remove the column or introduce a new column. So let's just imagine an arbitrary coin flip. So I'm going to flip a coin with probability one half. This is actually important to do. And I'm going to decide to reintroduce the J column or keep it removed from the model. So this is the exact same J that we got before. So I'm going to imagine this is like the fifth column or something like that. So the first time through, we removed, let's imagine we removed the J column. And so I have my new X matrix right here and I removed the J column. Now I'm gonna decide to maybe keep it removed. That happens with probability one half, or I'm gonna decide to introduce the J column back in. Okay, so one of those two things. If I decided to keep it removed, I don't do anything. It's already removed. I come down to this right here, and I go directly to that. The base factor you would compute for that is 1. So the posterior probability that you would get is also 1. A half. factor would be one, this is a half. I guess it, yeah, it doesn't matter. So you flip the coin with probability a half, you're either going to move to that new model, which is your old model, or you're going to move to your proposed model. So let's just remember what we've done. So x star, if this iteration, this is going to be equal to x minus j. Okay, so let's say we've done that, we've removed this, that's what this is at the very top. So I'm going to do one of two things. I'm going to either try to keep that variable removed, so I'll compute this base factor, it will be 1, this posterior probability will be 1 half. I flip the coin and I move to that new model with that j column still removed. So I actually haven't done anything. That J column is still removed. Or I can try to reintroduce that J column. 
And that's going to be a different base factor that we would compute. It's actually the inverse of this base factor. And I would take that one in, and I would plug it into this, I would get P star, and I would flip the coin, and I might move to that thing. So there's one of two things we're going to try to do in every iteration, is remove a column or not remove a column. So if the column's already removed, you don't do anything. So you could do the calculation if you want, but effectively you're not moving the model. That's very important. You might think, uh, if I have a variable already removed, maybe I should just do the opposite thing and try to put it back in there. But there should be some probability you stay at that same model at every step. And you're not always trying to force the move. That's why you have to flip a coin with probability a half and a half. You have to account for that proposal. It's a symmetric proposal setting it up that way so they cancel out of the metropolis ratio. So if you like to think about it that way. So now let's just imagine we run this thing for a long time and our current model looks like this. So I'll give you a, another possibility. So say I've run this algorithm for a long time. I'm now on the 105th iteration. And say the current model I'm going to call it x star. I'm going to say it looks like this. So this is going to go from x1, that one's in here, xp is in here, and let's say this one right here, j is equal to 3, is uh, beta 3 is equal to a 0, so I have that thing removed. And let's say I have another one removed as well. Let's say j is equal to 15. That's also been removed. So what I mean is I remove this and that right here. So what does this really look like? This looks like x minus 3 and minus 15. So that's our current model at this iteration. So I'm going to flip a coin again, and I'm going to grab something between 1 and P. Let's say I grab 4. Let's say this one. So J is equal to 4. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to compute the base factor down in the denominator. I'm going to compute this thing, where I compute the E and the V using that matrix. So the only thing that's ever changing is the X matrix that I'm plugging into all of this. And so if I try to remove the column, so if I flip the coin and I say with probability a half that I'm going to try to remove this J is equal to fourth column out of everything, then I would compute these things up at the numerator, but I would remove, I would have this matrix that I'd be using in the numerator. So minus 15 and minus 4. So that's going to happen with prob a half up front. I'm going to use this matrix. Or with probability 1 half, I'm going to let um, this stuff up here use this matrix again. So we'd be in that same exact situation where this base factor would be 1. And then when I did one of these two steps, I would wind up with the exact same matrix at the end because I'm trying to reintroduce that j, j is equal to 4 into the model space, but it's already in there. So we don't change anything. So here's what's going to happen effectively. You never really have to do this one. You're going to flip a coin with probability a half, and you're going to try to remove the variable or include it one or the other. So with probability one half, I'm going to try to remove it since it's already in the model at that iteration, then I'm going to compute this base factor right here. This will not be one. It'll be something different from one. I'll compute that probability and I'll remove the J is equal to fourth column with that probability. With probability a half, I just stay at that model. Does that make sense? And then you just keep repeating this. 
So this is exactly the same thing that we wrote down before, except I'm not cycling through everything in order. The j, the p is equal to j is equal to one all the way to p, and doing it every step. So effectively, I just need to run this thing p times longer to get the same on average performance. So that on average, I'm touching the variables the same amount of times and deciding, are you in the model or are you out of the model? Can't tell if that's clicked. Chris, can I see if this description summarizes it? Which is yeah. This correctly for me. Um, so we iterate continuously until I guess we've gotten down to, well, we've done a certain number of steps, T. Um, at each time, we select J uniformly from the unvarying list of 1 through P mm -hmm. um, with some probability uh, based on the base factor, which may be 1 if it's already been removed. We make something, a, a, generate a new model <coughs> candidate, and then with probability of 1 half, we either select that new candidate or we reject it. And that's how we complete the step. Yeah, there's, a, there's another probability in there. Let's just make sure we have it right. So at every step, I'm going to flip a coin with probability half. I'm either going to try to move the model, either by introducing that variable or removing it, one or the other. So, or I'm going to stay in the same model location. If I stay in the same model location, if that lands the probability half, you just kick yourself to the end, and your model hasn't moved at all. Or with some probability, you're going to compute a Bayes factor that's going to compare your current model to some other model. It's either going to be a grown model or a slightly reduced model. And you're going to compute that probability like this, by computing the Bayes factor and then doing this transformation of the Bayes factor. The coin flip comes up top, not at the bottom. Yeah, OK. So you flip the coin a half. You're either going to stay at the same model or you're going to move the model. If you're going to move the model, that's where this calculation comes in. So it might seem weird that it's like, why with probability one half do you stay in the same model space and why are you making that decision? It's because there has to be some probability that you stay at the same model without just rejecting the move or something like that. So it's the thing that makes it so that the proposal of Metropolis Hastings is symmetric. And we haven't worked out all those details, but if you don't do that half coin flip, your model probabilities that you converge to will be slightly wrong. So what are you getting at the end of every iteration right here? Effectively, you're storing some vector of indicators, probably. It's telling you what your current X model is. So what I would do is I would have a vector of indicators, ones and zeros, telling me what's in the model or what's not in the model. And then with that indicator, I could decide which X matrix I'm doing, because I could just remove everything from that indicator list. So I'm not sure exactly if you want the, the vector of indicators or if your, your data structure is just carrying these things around, you could do it either way. So I don't think it really makes any difference. Um, I just want to make sure I understood. So if we look at the x minus 3 minus 15, and let's say you do a coin flip and you say j is 3, then uh -huh. you're comparing x minus 3 minus 15 to x minus 15, is that what you're Uh-huh, that's right. Yeah, that sounds right. Um, let's, let me ask you a question. If at the end of every iteration, you're basically learning which beta j's are zeros and which ones are not zeros, what if you wanted the actual betas at the end of every iteration? So what we've done is we've already marginalized the betas out of everything. So if you wanted the actual betas at the end of iteration, there are implementations where you sample the beta j's at every step. We've removed that because it reduces computational burden. But if you wanted them, how would you get them? So you would have your current model. So it would have the x star in there. So what you would do is you take x star, I guess I've erased it. So x star transpose x star over sigma squared plus um, one over a psi squared identity inverse my variance. 
So I'll call that variance star, and then I would compute my corresponding expectation star, doing the same thing. So this would be just my variance star times x star transpose times y. So I would have those expectations and that variance for my current model at the end of every iteration, or some number of iterations. Maybe you do this like p times before you sample your beta, so some of them are moving, or at least you've given them a chance to move. And all you're going to do is you're going to compute your beta out of the current step. Beta star is going to be coming from a normal distribution with this expectation star in this variance star. So you just sample them. This would only give you the non-zero betas out of here, and all the other betas are zero. So you would have to rearrange your indices probably here, because let's say this is like seven-dimensional and p or 10, or something like that. Your indices wouldn't exactly line up, so you'd need to keep track of what x's or what, what betas those are corresponding to. But you can sample your vector of betas at every step. Maybe you don't want to do that, and you just want to run this for a long time, then grab your high probability models and figure out at the very end what do their betas look like. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to do Bayesian model averaging, you'd be averaging over these betas effectively. So at every iteration, you'd be getting different betas from different models. They'd have a point mass in there with some frequency of zero. You'd have these model average betas. So that's kind of cool. So if you took the mixture collection of betas where there are zeros and non-zeros that you're getting after some number of steps, so that's a mixture of betas, and they're kind of moving around with respect to whatever model they're in, those are called your BMA betas, model coefficients. So if you wanted to think about those and think, I don't know what the betas actually are, I'm uncertain about the model, but I want to account for the model uncertainty and give you betas, that are averaged over that model uncertainty, you give them the betas um, as you're sampling them at the end of every iteration here. You probably want to thin that a whole bunch of times. If you're just updating one beta at every step and you run this thing, you probably want to thin the heck out of it because you're only budging that vector just a little bit at every iteration. So you'd probably like run this for some number of iterations and then store everything and then run for some number of iterations and then store everything. Anyway. Could we go back to the what have probability thing? Uh -huh. So is it, is what you're saying is that we need to, is either the J, <coughs> excuse me, either the J beta is or is not a model. Yes. And so if it is. You're gonna flip a coin to say whether or not you're gonna stay at that model. Okay. And then if it, then you just, if right. happens, just the next or you're yeah exactly. If you stay at the same model, you just don't compute the base factor or anything like that. Because with probability one half, you're going to move to this new model, which is your old model. Or with probability one half, you're going to move to the new model, which is your old model. <laughs> so, so you're going to do the exact same thing. Yeah. So, so with probability a half, you're going to stay at the same model location. With probability one half, you're going to compute a new, ba new base factor. The numerator and the denominator are going to vary just by one column being different in the X matrix that defines the numerator and the denominator. So if it's out, you're going to be introducing it in. And so the base factor would probably look flipped upside down. Because this, the way I've written it, is that's a bigger model than that model. And so if you're moving to the bigger model, you flip that thing upside down. If that column is already in the X matrix, then if you're moving the model, it means you're going to remove it. So let's just do this. Generate a J. So generate a J, and with probability one half, you're not going to do anything. You're just going to kick it to the end and go back up to the top. With probability one half, you're going to try to move something. So if J was in the model, you're going to remove it. If J wasn't in the model, you're going to add it in. So it's going to be one of those two things. So probability one half, you don't do anything. 
probability one half, if J wasn't in the model, you're going to introduce it in. If J was in the model, you're going to remove it out. Which probability are you going to use to compute that? That's the P star. How are you going to be computing that P star? You're just going to be reforming this base factor with different X matrices in the numerator and the denominator. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's a little confusing to explain how an algorithm works. So, but I think we've got it. Cool. What else? Yeah. Um, I don't know. So we we asked the question, how much data? Uh -huh. It's like, well, you're gonna have your indicators for like, the best parameters. That's Why can you just do a linear? You can. That's effectively what you're doing right here when you sample those. You're just doing regression on that particular model. You. The only difference is that you've used Ridge to compute these right here. So you have the lambdas in, like if you used flat prior at the very bottom, you could come in and use flat prior at the end, but you can't do it when you're doing selection. So at the very end, if you wanted your betas and you don't want them regularized or lassoed up, or sorry, not lasso, ridged up, then you would just make this thing effectively infinity, and that would be pushing you to the flat prior. So if you wanted to use that flat prior and you said, I, I only introduce this sort of ridge parameter just to do selection, so I had a proper prior so that you can compare two things to each other. Um, that would be the only difference. So at the end of every iteration right here, if you're sampling these beta based off of your current model's expectation and variance, you are essentially just doing that linear regression at every iteration. The only difference that we're talking about is you wait to the very end to do it. It gives you an opportunity to do something slightly different where you're gonna say, I wanna not regularize my space and squish them towards zero. So this is a common question. It's like, at the end of all of this, do you still use ridge regression to tell me what the thing is? And I think the answer is no. I usually report the um, unregularized betas back to everybody, and I just do ridge for the selection. So I've seen other people say uh, it doesn't really matter, and I guess that just depends on how hard they regularized everything. So, but usually I just use the ridge or something like that for selecting. So, of course, if I get some model that's not full rank, then you might give ridge anyway, but the big question would be, why is it not full rank? So I'd probably stand back and, and try to say something about that. What do the X's actually mean in your model? But yeah, I think it's the, about the same thing, just a little bit different depending on what size squares you use to give your estimated betas. I would probably give unbiased estimates for my videos after selection. All right, thank you for answering this question, but I didn't catch it. Um, so why exactly do you, um, like what probability of one half you decide whether or not to change the model uh -huh. and if you do decide to change the model then you do another probability p yeah, star that's right why that first half yeah probability instead of just like i'm just going to grab the j column if it's not in there i'm going to force it to be it's because the proposal needs to be symmetric you need to account for how many times you're proposing a model and a model move in one direction and it needs to be fair and so if you actually work through detailed balance in Metropolis Hastings, it's only detailed balance if you include those half probabilities in there. So it just means that your chain isn't time reversible if you don't have those halves in there. So you'd have to check the detailed balance condition on it. But detailed balance only holds if you're being fair in the proposal space and setting up this proposal back and forth. If you didn't do that, you would have to account for another probability. And so I'm just trying to make it simpler. I'm making it less efficient, or, but simpler by including those halves. What else? Very exciting, huh? Model selection. Sorry, you said that 
the expectation was that we complete the SSVS and the other models are essentially for us if we choose to try and implement them? Model 2 and Model 3, you mean? No, I, I meant um, there's four modes of modeling. There was SSVS, there was Lasso, and there were others. Yeah, I really just wanted you to compare three things to each other. So everybody's got their favorite things. If you want to do stepwise selection with uh, Mallow CP, uh, I'll, I'll take that as well. So AIC, BIC are very similar to those. So doing lasso is kind of fun. So I think I could give you a hundred th different things to compare. What I really want you to notice is in model one, it, the model that I gave you, so the data, data set one, um, probably doesn't really make that much of a difference which model selection technique you use. And in data set three, you're gonna get three different answers. And I just want you to notice that. So when everybody's coming back and saying, oh, I've got this optimal model selection procedure, um, you might not be so quick to accept that. Say, well, show me comparisons to other things. And so what I've noticed is sometimes people will use their straw man competitor and they'll do something like Lasso. And Lasso's penalizing all the betas in a way that it kind of assumes they're all independent of each other, all the X's are. And so if you had something like multi-collinearity in there, Lasso doesn't get that right. So it, it, it has a hard time with things like that. And so maybe their SSVS with the horseshoe prior works great on things just like that. And so, and they've included all those interaction terms and they've probably even cheated sometimes and said, I know which subset of interactions even to explore over. So I see results in colloquium that say their method picks out the right parameters 95% of the time and the nearest competitor is 20% of the time. And I'm always like, there's something fishy about that. So why is it that we can see so many different model selection talks over and over and over again? I mean, I've been seeing these for 20 years now. New model selection technique, somebody has the best model selection technique. And the only reason that game can keep being played is there is no correct answer. To be principled about it, you'd have to know what is my model for generating models in the first place. I'd need some probability mechanism and I'd have to model that. But that's not how we get models in the first place. So there's no attempt to even be objective at it. So it's really just a question of how hard you're pushing those things towards zero, betas towards zero, and in which manner are you pushing them towards zero. So there's a lot of literature on um, tail robustness. So in, in Lasso, the tails come down too fast, they say. So there's attempts to pick up the tails and make them more like Toshi tails. That's what the horseshoe does, if you've ever heard of that. And so it's really just a statement of how hard you're trying to push those betas towards zero. So if you have model spaces where your P is really large, but the true model is nested inside of that, and um, the true number of covariates is really tiny compared to what you're searching over. If you have a technique that pushes betas towards zero really hard, it'll do a better job than a technique that doesn't push all those betas towards zero really hard. If you had problems where true P was pretty large, let's say 100, and, or let's say your P that you're searching through, so your X matrix is 100 dimensional, so 100 columns, but the true number of covariates, 90% of them, so 90 of them actually should be in there and there's only 10 that are noise. So I would say that's not a very sparse problem. So you'd want a regularization technique that doesn't push everything towards zero really hard. So it's like, it really is a question of how dense or sparse is the true model inside the X's that you're searching over. And techniques that push really hard work really well on sparse model spaces. And we never know the answer to that. Like how many X's do you think are the true X's or the X's we should be using? And nobody knows. So it's more of a question of how did you get all those X's? Where did they come from? So did you just like run an algorithm on the internet and it just collected a ton of garbage? Or were you a judicious scientist and you collected everything for a good reason? Those are two different mechanisms. So, and I bet, you know, if we did model selection, you know, on somebody that's just running an algorithm and collecting a bunch of garbage, you'd probably want a model selection technique that pushes a lot of stuff out. 
So, but if you had a judicious scientist, you'd probably say, I don't want to regularize too hard. You know, I want to see, maybe there's a few variables in here that are extraneous and I want to kick those out. But to the scientist, all of those variables really meant something. So let's see how influential they are on the response. So those would be two different things. So I don't think there's a correct answer. You were reading through this Berger and Selkie paper, and you probably got to the conclusions where it's like, for the point null problem, this problem, essentially hypothesis testing, this really is hypothesis testing, in some sense that there is no impartial or objective way to do that problem. There just isn't. There's no correspondence between how p-values operate or posterior probabilities. And they even say in that paper that you're reading, picking pi naught, your priors on beta j's being equal to zero, being a half is too high. And what they probably mean to say, but this was like in the 1980s they said it, is the, the um, alternative priors placing too much mass on that point too. So there's kind of a, a double stacking of mass on beta j is equal to zero because the alternative prior places mass right around it and then you place probability one half and you use a point mass that stacks a ton of mass on it. And they even criticize themselves and they say it seems to place too much mass on beta j's being equal to zero and pushes things out, you know, too easily. And so there's probably no objective answer to that question. What are you going to do though? <laughs> you know, it's like I used to think model selection is not a, that there's no real answer to any of this. Is this even a, a thing statisticians should touch? And so philosophically, I think maybe the answer is no, but you can't just say to somebody when they come in, hey, I've got all these X's, do something. And it's like, I'm not doing it. <laughs> you know? You've got to do something. And so anyway, I, I like to look over lots of different model selection techniques and see what they all tell me. And then ultimately with those models, I like to compute things like likelihood ratios and show what the likelihood ratio is. And I say, hey, this model explains the data three times better than that model. But this model, that other model explains the data really well compared to all the other models. So I'll report both of them. So I'm kind of a coward when it comes down to it. I'm like, I'll just report everything that looks interesting. But I think that's what you should do. And then if you really think it's mechanistic and it's like there's only some covariates that explain the whys, you know, you'd do a follow-up study, something like that. My guess is when you're thinking about all of this, in the real world, there's no model out there that has y is equal to x transpose beta. That's not the way it works, you know? And so that already is a fiction. It's just a way that we can kind of like get some coarse answer that these x's somehow relate to the y's. They seem to be a, doing a good job explaining their variation, but is that exactly how it happens out there in nature? I don't think so. That's a statistical model. They're convenient. We can interpret everything. We know the interpretation of betas that with a one unit increase in that covariate, you get a beta unit increase in the response, something like that. So we like that interpretation, but that's probably not exactly how it actually happens. So I always think this stuff's just kind of a crude approximation to figuring stuff out. So, but that's pretty much what we do, right? I don't know, I don't think we're actual truth seekers. I think that we're just kind of like kicking the can and learning more and more stuff. And it's like, oh, we can use this. We can, we know that Newton's laws aren't true but we can launch ourselves to the moon and go explore Mars, and so they're pretty good. So that course approximation isn't that bad. So, I don't know. We could have a long discussion about that, and we already have, so. Anything else? Are there any strategies for trying to build in um, like the interactions between the different columns? Like, yeah. you just put them all in, or is there like I, I wouldn't, right? You just overfit everything okay. super quickly. So if you try to throw them all in there and entertain all of them, um, I usually would probably start with main effects and figure out the main effect models. And then I would see out of things with main effects, strong main effects, are there interaction terms? But that's kind of, then I would layer in the interaction terms based off of those main effects later. There are things called interaction plots you can look at, but looking over zillions of them, you can't really look at. So um, I'm always really afraid of interactions. And even like a three-way interaction, I, nobody knows how to interpret it. 
It's like, what does it mean? Like even the direction on the sign, if I have two negative signs, you know, for x1 and x3 multiplying into each other, um, you know, versus x1 and x2 multiplying into each other, I can get the same sign, but everything means a different thing. So I don't know, I'm really afraid to even put in like three-way interactions unless there's like a good scientific reason to do it. So, but um, probably look for main effects and then include the interaction terms. You can get tricked though, because if it doesn't have the main effect in there, but only the interactive effect, my method will fail in searching through that. So I usually want to know from the scientist, what is the meaning of all this, these X's? So what do you think they mean? You know, why do you think they should be part of the problem? So I, I like to sit down and be really slow about this stuff. You know, but including all of them, I try to do it. And I just overfit everything instantly. So in any reasonable data set. So I, I tried to do this with like March Madness data and stuff like that and build in all the interactions. So I wanted like player heights and weights and stuff like that interactions of all of those, um, what would you call those, morphology stats or something like that, and see how they interact with player stats. And so, uh, too many to even, so I started thinking about there's specific ones I actually have in mind, so I'll check for those ones. So I think you should be judicious and be scientific and not just go, some statistical algorithm told me with P is equal to whatever, that this is in there and I'm gonna give it no more thought. So I think just using this stuff automatically is probably not a great thing to do. So what should we do when you're the scientist? What's the problem, I guess, you know? So where did you get your X's from? You know, things like that. So what I might do, if it's just a ton of X's, I don't know where they came from, I might do main effects and run lasso real quickly. Just pare down the space. Okay. And then if the, data set is large enough that I might be able to build in a bunch of meaningful interactions and then do SSBS. So I'm gonna do some filtering technique first, probably Lasso. And Lasso doesn't work particularly well with interactions anyway, so I'd search for the main effects, and then I would kind of say, well, if the um, main effect, effect is interesting, then I'll look for interactions there, because there's a million ways you could explain data. So anyway, Lasso first, and then something more judicious later on. Is that okay? Yeah. I, I try to avoid it at all costs. So hypothesis testing in general, I try to just avoid it. So. Anything else you guys? I have not made the exam, but I've made 16 years worth of exams for this class. So I, I probably have not made it. So I don't think I'm gonna come at anything too crazy. I'll probably ask you to work out a things back here. So that's probably something that you can do. Show me that you've actually worked out, you know, certain base factors, and I might have you compute a base factor for comparing two specific models. So who knows? There'll probably be a Jeffries prior calculation on there, but you won't be under a lot of pressure to uh, shoot. Do I remember what a Poisson looks like? And, you know, do, do I know how to sum this thing out just right and remember what that trick is? So I think that at the take-home test, you can use all your books, all your notes, you just can't consult each other. So everything, open notes, open everything. So they don't come from the class, everything. Is that fair? I don't believe in the take-home test in its closed book. So... <laughs> That, that's testing people on something else. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it's not meant to be too grueling. It'll give you a little bit more time to spend on this last one. Obviously. So you'll be sending me any extra credit that you have, Baron's Fischel, for instance, a test, and this last film assignment all together is one email. Sound good? Great. Thank you guys.
So one of them's a proposal, and then one of them's the acceptance. Yes. And then I think, in, I think the the full X, I mean the big, the, the capital X, it has all the data that you want us to use. Right? Mm -hmm. Then why you are talking about like inter intersection between data? I mean, I mean, so you're talking about the intersections. Uh, so I mean, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the bigger the capital X is constructed in this way, like we have three features, and then we think maybe the square of one feature will be that for any that's model estimation, and then we combine all this like polynomial combination, and then we, we formalize the capital X. Right. So you'll reform X. Wait, you didn't do a reform X. So you, I'm giving you the X's, but I haven't. Giving you columns for interactions or quadratic. Okay. I might actually be. Oh, okay, so they are. You'll have features. to make them. Yeah, that's right. They're just the raw oh, features. Yeah. They're not the interactions or the columns. Oh, okay. You okay. would have to make those. The bears. Okay. So imagine it's just like a scientist came to you and said, here's data I measured. And you don't know if it's like polynomially related and things like that. So you have to do all those transformations up front. There's no algorithms to really okay. help you do it. Okay, okay, I got it, got it, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So in the, I never did anything, I didn't do any super high order polynomial terms, but in the model, the third data set, there are some polynomial yeah, terms and yeah. interactions. So you would have to form those to even try to select them. Oh, okay, okay, I see. Thank you. There's lots of cases, like for Okay. Okay. 